Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated. Ring gong. Yay. Good afternoon, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Evelyn Burnett, Vice President of Economic Opportunity at Cleveland Neighborhood Progress, and a proud member of the City Club. It's my pleasure to welcome today's speaker, research associate of the Economic Policy Institute and the author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America, Richard Rothstein. This is Mr. Rothstein's second appearance at the City Club podium. In February of 2015, he gave an impassioned address on the impact of housing policy on segregation and public education in the United States. In the ensuing two years, Mr. Rothstein turned those themes presented at the City Club into a book, The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. A little context. Since Brown versus Board of Education ruled to desegregate schools, the percentage of African American students in white majority schools increased to peak at 43.5% in 1988. Today, the trend is reversing. A recent report from UCLA's Civil Rights Project showed that number had dropped by nearly half to 23.2%, a comparable percentage to 1968. In the 21st century, we are becoming more segregated, not less. While many education and public policy scholars will point to a myriad of reasons for this trend, Mr. Rothstein focuses on the impact of state, federal, and state and federal housing policies had on segregating metropolitan areas and creating racially homogenous neighborhoods with implications that are still evident today. In addition to his role at the Economic Policy Institute, Mr. Rossing is a fellow at the Third Good Marshall Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and the Haas Institute at the University of California at Berkeley. He earned his Bachelor, Art, Bachelor of Arts degree from Harvard College. Prior to associating with the Economic Policy Institute, Mr. Rothstein was a lecturer at Teachers College at Columbia University and a visiting scholar in the Harvard Graduate School of Education. He served as the National Education Columnist of the New York Times and as a contributing editor for the American Prospect. In addition to The Color of Law, Mr. Rothstein has authored and co-authored several other books on accountability in education, the black-white achievement gap, charter schools, and equality in the context of public and private education. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Richard Rothstein. Thank you very, very much, and um, I'm, I'm so grateful that the, the City Club invited me back again to um, uh, continue the conversation that I started with you uh, uh, almost three years ago. Um, as you all know, uh, in the mid-20th century, this country uh, made a commitment to abolish racial segregation. Uh, we began in the 1930s uh, with uh, legal cases that abolished segregation in law schools because the civil rights groups figured that even judges could understand that you can't get a good education in a segregated law school. They then went on to attack segregation in graduate schools. The lead case was in a school of pharmacy. After that, uh, we did colleges in 1954, as, as you just, was just mentioned. Uh, we abolished segregation uh, in elementary and secondary schools. In the 1960s, we abolished segregation in uh, uh, restaurants and buses and water fountains uh, and public accommodations of all kind. Uh, we understood that segregation was immoral, it was harmful, it was unconstitutional. And yet, everywhere in the country, 
we have accepted the biggest segregation of all and done nothing to try to remedy it, done nothing to try to eliminate it. We accept it as part of the natural environment, and that is residential segregation, the fact that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated. Uh, I've lived in many of them. I've never lived in one that wasn't segregated, and it's certainly the case here in Cleveland. Well, why is it that we eliminated segregation in every other area of American life except, as I say, the most powerful segregation of all, and that is our racial boundaries in every metropolitan area. And I think the reason is, is begins to be uh, clear. One is that uh, it's much more difficult to abolish segregation uh, in residences than it is in any of these other areas. If we abolish segregation in water fountains or in buses, uh, the next day you can sit anywhere you want on a bus or drink from any water fountain. But if we pass the law abolishing residential segregation, the next day not much would happen. And so it's a difficult thing to undo, more difficult than these other areas. And because it's difficult, we've adopted a, and created a national rationalization that um, uh, excuses us from trying to deal with this most difficult area of segregation. And that's a theory that has been adopted across the political spectrum. It's not just one held by conservatives. or um, it's, it's shared by conservatives and liberals. It's one that's shared, I think, by uh, almost everyone in this room. And that is a myth that we've developed that we give the term de facto segregation. We say that we, don't, we can't really uh, do anything about residential segregation because unlike these other segregations that we abolished, residential segregation is de facto. That's a, a fancy term for saying happened by accident. It sort of evolved. It happened because, oh, there was private prejudice, maybe a uh, a homeowner might not want to sell a home to an African-American in a white neighborhood, or real estate agents might have uh, steered families from uh, one place to another. Um, maybe uh, African-Americans and whites simply like to live with each other, with others of the same race. Uh, maybe African-Americans just don't have enough income to move to white middle-class neighborhoods. All of these individual accidental uh, uh, factors uh, that add up to residential segregation but for which the government is not responsible, just as it was responsible for segregation in buses or water fountains or schools or colleges. And the Supreme Court has promoted this idea, and it's one, as I say, it's not simply one of the conservatives in the Supreme Court. Liberals on the Supreme Court accept it as well, and it's become part of our national conversation. They promoted the idea that if you have de facto segregation, that is segregation that just happened by accident, uh, there's nothing really you can do about it, and not only that, there's nothing you can be permitted to do about it. It would be a violation of the Constitution to try to do anything about de facto segregation, because that would require having a racial remedy for something that wasn't caused by a racial policy. Only if you have de jure segregation, the Supreme Court says, segregation by government law or public policy or regulation, only then is there a constitutionally permitted remedy? In fact, it's not only that there's a constitutionally permitted remedy, there's a constitutionally ob obligated remedy. If we have a constitutional violation, we're obligated to undo it. So this is a big, important difference. If this myth, which I'm calling a myth, of de facto segregation is true, then we're going to live with uh, residential segregation for as long as any of us will have descendants in this country. But if it's the fact that this is a myth, if, in fact, residential segregation was created unconstitutionally by racially explicit federal, state, and local policy designed to create racial boundaries in every metropolitan area of this country and prevent uh, African Americans and whites from living with one another, then we're obligated to undo it. It's a constitutional violation. And so I began to investigate a number of years ago whether this myth was the case. I actually, as, as you heard, I used to spend a lot of time doing education policy. There was a Supreme Court case in 2007 in which the Supreme Court prohibited the school districts of Louisville and Seattle, Washington, from a very token uh, uh, desegregation plan. They both had school choice plans, and uh, if uh, a child applied to a school, 
and there was one place left, and both a black child and a white child applied. Uh, the uh, child who would help to um, redress racial imbalance in the school would be given preference. You couldn't imagine a more token plan. Uh, most children don't want to go to school outside their own neighborhoods and away from their friends. And the cases where you have one place left and both a black and a white child apply is trivial. So you couldn't imagine the more token, trivial desegregation plan. The Supreme Court said it was unconstitutional to do this, to allow uh, the districts to uh, attempt to redress racial imbalance in the schools because the schools in Louisville and Seattle were segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. And the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated de facto, and therefore there's nothing we are permitted to do, do, do anything about. Well, I remembered in, uh, in, when I read that case in 2007 and I began this research about a situation in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the cities where um, the case arose, where a white home or in a white suburb, this was in the 1950s, uh, all white suburb, had a friend who was an African-American Navy veteran, a, a middle class uh, fellow with a family who wanted better housing. Nobody would sell him a home in a white neighborhood. So this uh, uh, white family uh, bought another house in, in their neighborhood and resold it to the African-American friend. And when the African-American friend moved in, a mob surrounded the home, protected by the police. Uh, the window, rocks were thrown through the windows. The home was dynamited and firebombed uh, to drive the African-American family out of the neighborhood. And when this was all said and done, the state of Kentucky arrested, uh, tried, uh, convicted and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition. And I said to myself, this doesn't sound to me much like de facto segregation in Louisville, <laughs> Kentucky. And, uh, you know, I knew a little bit more about it than that, obviously, and I, but I, I thought that the, uh, this myth was a very dangerous one and it needed to be demolished. So that's the origins of this book. And I don't have time uh, this morning to... Uh, uh, go into all of the many, many federal, state, and local policies that were explicitly designed to preserve racial segregation or create it where it hadn't previously existed. But let me just spend a few minutes talking about a few of them. I'll try to use Cleveland examples where I can. Public housing is one. Now, most of us have an image of what public housing is. It's a place where poor people live. It's a place where uh, lots of single mothers with uh, children. Um, it's a place where young men are without hope and uh, engaged in uh, 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 informal economic activity, illegal economic activity, uh, engage in oppositional behavior that attracts the attention of the police and then uh, sets off a cycle of violence, which often leads to um, uh, deaths of, of uh, young African-American men in those neighborhoods. That's what our Im image of public housing. It's, in fact, not how public housing began in this country. Public housing began in this country as a program primarily for white, working class and middle class families during the Great Depression because there was a housing shortage. It wasn't a subsidy for poor people. It was for middle class, working class, white families who had no homes because there were no homes to be had uh, during the Great Depression. Uh, in many cases, uh, public housing uh, uh, officials um, sent social workers into the homes of applicants for public housing to make sure that their children were well behaved, to make sure that uh, they had adequate furniture uh, to maintain the high standards of public housing. Uh, frequently, uh, uh, families who apply for public housing had to show marriage certificates to guarantee to the public housing authority that there'd be no hanky-panky going on in public housing. That's what public housing began in, in the Great Depression. The Public Works Administration was the first agency uh, of the New Deal, established in 1933, and the first agency ever to build public housing, housing for civilians uh, in this country. And the public housing, the Public Works Administration built housing across the country on a segregated basis, frequently creating segregation where it hadn't previously been known, and creating patterns of segregation in communities that last until this day. Uh, here in Cleveland, uh, uh, I'm sure many of you read, uh, have read the uh, autobiography of the great uh, African-American poet, novelist, uh, uh, playwright Langston Hughes. Uh, Hughes describes how he grew up in a neighborhood in Cleveland that was integrated. It was about actually half white and half black. Uh, that may surprise you. Uh, if we were transported back to the mid-20th century or early 20th century in metropolitan areas around the country, we would be stunned at the extent of integrated neighborhoods that existed everywhere in the country. 
The reason was quite simple. Uh, workers didn't have automobiles to get to work. And so if they were going to work in a downtown factory or any other workplace, and most workplaces were downtown, they had to live close enough to be able to walk. So if you had a, a factory or another workplace with um, uh, Irish immigrant workers and Italian immigrant workers and Jewish immigrant workers and African Americans, they all had to live in roughly the same neighborhoods. In fact, there was a guarantee that every metropolitan area would at least have some integrated neighborhoods because the major means of inter intercity transportation were the railroads. We didn't have interstate highways at that time. And the, the railroads would only hire African Americans as baggage handlers or as Pullman car porters. So every community had to have African Americans living close enough to the railroad terminals to get to work. And these were generally in, in white neighborhoods, mostly white neighborhoods, that were integrated. Well, as I say, Langston Hughes grew up in a neighborhood, uh, the central neighborhood of Cleveland, uh, that was about half black, half white. Uh, he says he dated a Jewish girl um, in high school. His best friend was Polish. This was the environment in many urban areas throughout the country. The Public Works Administration demolished integrated neighborhood in that, um, in integrated housing in that neighborhood and built two separate ha projects. The Althwaite, am I pronouncing that right? The Althwaite homes was for African Americans. The Cedar Central homes were for whites. This is not de facto segregation. It's not because whites happened to apply to the Cedar Central homes and African Americans happened to apply to the Althwaite homes because they like to live with others of the same race. These were explicitly designated by race public housing projects that created a segregated pattern in the central area of Cleveland uh, that persisted for many, many years afterwards, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about what happened later, uh, but that otherwise wouldn't have existed. This was an integrated neighborhood. As I did the research for this book, the thing that um, struck me the most and depressed me the most was how easily this could have been avoided. If those projects had been open on a non-discriminatory basis, Families wouldn't have refused to move in. Certainly there would have been some white families who wouldn't have wanted to live in an integrated building. They wouldn't have moved in, but there was an enormous housing shortage. The lines of the, the applicants for these projects were long. They would have filled them on an integrated basis had they opened them on, on a non-discriminatory basis, and we would have had a very different pattern that developed in Cleveland uh, throughout the entire metropolitan area. The Public Works Administration also built another project in Cleveland, the Lakeview Homes, uh, which was a much... Uh, better constructed and, and uh, more amenities, and also only for whites. African Americans uh, need not apply. It was explicitly for whites only. And this went on throughout the country. Um, everywhere in the country, the Public Works Administration created segregation where it hadn't previously existed, or in some cities where there had been a great migration during World War I, reinforced segregated patterns that already existed. Um, I like to talk in my book about uh, places like Cambridge, Massachusetts and uh, Berkeley, California, because I figure that uh, these are thought of as being the most liberal areas of the country, and if these things happened in those places, you can understand that it happened everywhere. In Cambridge, Massachusetts, I don't know if any of you ever went to school in Cambridge, but the area near MIT is called the um, Central Square neighborhood. That was also a neighborhood that was about half black and half white. The Public Works Administration built two separate projects, one for African Americans and one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation in the Boston metropolitan area that otherwise would never have developed in that way. The practice really uh, uh, ramped up during World War II when hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production to take jobs in, in war industries. There had been no jobs in the Depression. And uh, again, the, the, the government had to find housing for these workers. Uh, the, the centers of war protection were expanding in population in fantastic ways. I, I focus in my book on a community just north of Berkeley called Richmond, California, which was a center of shipbuilding uh, in, on the West Coast. The Kaiser shipyards were based in, um, in uh, Richmond. And um, uh, Richmond, uh, before World War II, had a population of a little bit less than 20,000. Uh, all white. There were a few African Americans living on the outskirts and working as domestics in the homes of white families. But it was a white community, all white community. By the end of World War II, the population of Richmond was 100,000 because of the shipyards. I, I don't know if you can imagine what it's like for a community in just four years to grow from 20,000 to 100,000. Um, I find it unimaginable. Um, but the federal government had to find housing for these workers, these hundreds of thousands of workers who were flocking to the West Coast to work in the defense industry, and so they did. They built housing for war workers. For the African Americans, they built the housing, on, the temporary housing, because the explicit 
A goal of the housing was that African Americans after World War II would leave Richmond to go back to the South. Uh, so they built temporary housing for the African Americans along the railroad tracks and near the shipyards, and they built more stable housing for the white migrants in the white residential areas of Richmond, creating a pattern of segregation in the Bay Area, and this is, I, there are many, many other examples of war industries in the Bay Area, creating a pattern of segregation in the San Francisco Bay Area that otherwise never would have developed. It never would have developed. This was not a segregated community. The Public Works Administration was not preserving community patterns. It was creating segregation where it otherwise would never have existed. Um, after World War II, there was an enormous civilian housing shortage still. Uh, <coughs> Not only had no civilian housing been built during the Depression except for these public projects that I talked about, during World War II, it was impermissible to use construction materials for uh, civilian purposes, so no housing was built for civilians during World War II. And then after the war, you had, uh, as you all know, millions of returning war veterans coming home and forming families and living in Quonset huts and in open fields and doubled and tripled and quadrupled up with, with relatives because there was no civilian housing available. So President Truman, uh, proposed a massive expansion of the National Public Housing Program. And remember, this is for working families. These were returning war veterans who had jobs in the great post-war boom. This was not for poor people. He proposed a vast expansion of the public housing program to house returning war veterans. Conservatives in Congress, led by uh, your former senator, Robert Taft, uh, opposed this project, and they wanted to defeat it. They wanted to defeat the public housing program. Not for racial reasons. Remember, this was a segregated program, and not because they didn't like poor people. This was not for poor people, but simply because they thought that public housing uh, was socialistic and the government shouldn't be involved in, in the housing industry. So they wanted to defeat it. And they came up with a, a proposal to defeat this um, uh, bill. Uh, and uh, it's something that we've come to call, the political scientists come to call a poison pill strategy. I don't know if you're familiar with that term, but. Uh, a poison pill strategy in Congress is where um, uh, opponents of a bill try to get an amendment passed on the bill. Uh, and if the amendment is passed, it will make the entire bill un unpalatable and the entire bill will go down to defeat. So Taft and his colleagues came up with the idea of proposing an amendment to the 1949 Housing Act that went as follows from now on, public housing has to be integrated. No more discrimination in public housing. Um, their idea was that they would vote for this amendment. Northern liberals would join them in voting for the amendment. That would create a majority to pass the amendment and attach it to the 1949 Housing Act. And then when the full act came up for a vote on the floor, the conservatives would flip and vote against the entire bill. Southern Democrats would then join them because they were all in favor of public housing if it was segregated but not if, if it was, had to be integrated, and that would create a majority against the bill, and the bill would go down to defeat. So northern liberals campaigned against the integration amendment, led by Hubert Humphrey, uh, the leading civil rights advocate in the United States Senate, or uh, Paul Douglas of Illinois, another leading civil rights advocate. They campaigned against the integration amendment, and they succeeded. They succeeded in defeating the integration amendment. So the 1949 Housing Act, was passed with an explicit rejection of non-discrimination as part of federal housing programs. And the federal government then used that vote not only to continue to segregate public housing, but to segregate all of its housing programs for the next decade. Now, you know, to me, 1949 isn't so long ago. It's, a, you know, it's, it's pretty recent history. And that's how um, federal policy was made. Well, shortly after that happened, um, the, the public projects began to be built in the, um, uh, across the country. Uh, some of you are familiar with uh, the pruitt Igo homes, uh, the giant towers in St. Louis, or Robert Taylor in Chicago, or, or projects in this area as well. And a development occurred everywhere, which was quite strange. Uh, projects like uh, Cedar Central, the white projects, suddenly developed large numbers of vacancies. And the projects like Althwaite, um, for African Americans had long waiting lists. Everywhere in the country this happened. Eventually it became so conspicuous that uh, all of the projects had to be opened up to African Americans. At about the same time, as you all know, in the 1950s, industry was leaving the cities, so there were fewer and fewer jobs. People became, who were living in these projects became poorer and poorer. Um, eventually they came to be subsidized and came to be the kinds of uh, 
uh, public slums that we know as public housing today, but that's not how it began. Well, the question that you should be asking yourself, uh, and I asked myself when I, when I discovered this in the research, is why did all these vacancies occur in the white projects and not in the African-American ones? And it turns out that was primarily because of another federal program that was even more powerful in creating a pattern of the segregation in this country than even the public housing program. And that was a program of the Federal Housing Administration that was explicitly designed to suburbanize the white population of this country into single-family homes in the suburbs. It was actually a program that began uh, long before in the Woodrow Wilson administration. Some geniuses in that administration uh, decided that after the Russian Revolution that the way to keep uh, white workers from becoming communists was to get them into single-family homes because homeowners couldn't be communists. And so, I'm serious, I'm serious, I'm serious. Um, uh, it's, it's all in print, it's all there, it's all the public policy. Um, and throughout the 1920s, the, the federal government had a propaganda campaign uh, warning whites that they were gonna be, and there were these posters showing uh, typically black uh, criminals being arrested and that they were gonna uh, be subject to crime if they didn't move to the suburbs. Uh, they sent the uh, representatives to communities around the country telling white families that the way to avoid racial strife was to get into um, single family homes in the suburbs. But it wasn't a very effective program because they didn't have much money behind it. Uh, they didn't have any money behind it actually, it was just a propaganda campaign and most working class families couldn't afford to buy single family homes in the suburbs. It was the Federal Housing Administration, another New Deal agency, established in 1934, that put money behind this uh, uh, public uh, propaganda campaign. And the way they did it was by recruiting a cadre of mass production builders of entire subdivisions who would agree to build all white suburbs as a condition of getting federal bank guarantees. And the most famous of these is probably Levittown, east of New York City, um, 17,000 homes, um, uh, uh, giant subdivision, but they were all over the country. They were in this area, they were in Chicago, they were on the West Coast. The symbol, the great the symbol of suburbanization in the 1950s was Los Angeles. The giant subdivision of Lakewood um, was one of these FHA developments. So was a Panorama City in, in the San Fernando Valley. All over the country, the Federal Housing Administration subsidized these developments. So someone like Levitt, for example, uh, could never have assembled the capital to build 17,000 homes for which he had no buyers. What bank would be crazy enough to give somebody a, a loan to build 17,000 homes? The only way Levitt was able to build Levittown or any of these other subdivisions that uh, were done all over the country was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, submitting um, uh, his, uh, the materials he was going to use, the architectural design, the layout of the of the um, streets in the subdivision, and a commitment never to sell a home to an African American. And by that, uh, by making those commitments, the Federal Housing Administration then gave a guarantee to any bank who would lend him the money to develop the subdivision uh, to, to grant him the construction loans, and that's the basis on which all of these subdivisions were built. This is not something that was informal. This was not something of a rogue uh, uh, a bureaucrat in the Federal Housing Administration. The Federal Housing Administration's underwriting manual, which went to every appraiser in the country as a, as a uh, standard for conditions that should be used in order to um, uh, approve applications for FHA guarantees for subdivision creation, said specifically that no approval should be given to a development that uh, ran the risk of incompatible racial elements. The underwriting manual recommended that highways be built to separate African American and black communities to make sure that there'd be no encroachment. Um, this was an explicit written regulation policy of the federal government. Um, and on this basis, um, subdivisions were built all over the country, um, uh, surrounding central cities, creating what the analysts later called a white noose around central cities uh, uh, that's, that created the racial patterns, the segregation patterns that we know today. Now let me uh, uh, conclude just with a few more remarks about the, there are many, many of these other policies. I don't, as I say, I don't have time to go into them here, but in, in my book I describe dozens of other policies, ex equally explicit, followed by the federal, state, and local governments to ensure racial segregation in metropolitan areas. But let me uh, conclude by talking about what the effects of it are and why they are so powerful today. Why we can't simply 
as easily undo racial segregation as we undid the other segregations we talked about. The developments that I, I just mentioned, the giant suburbs, oh, and, and I'm, I'm just to close the loop, uh, obviously that's why all the vacancies developed in the, uh, the, the housing projects are occupied by whites, uh, because uh, um, the uh, whites were being subsidized. They were subsidized to such an extent that they could move from public housing, a, a project like Cedar Central, into a white suburb, single family home in the suburb with a VA loan or an FHA loan and pay less in their monthly carrying charges than they were paying for rent in public housing. That's how enormous this subsidy was. All right, so what, what was the consequence of this? Well, those homes in those days, uh, in all of these suburbs, they sold for $10,000 or less, $8,000, $9,000 uh, a piece. Um, in today's money, that's uh, less than $100,000, probably $90,000 roughly speaking. White working class families were turning war veterans. I mean, my uncle was one. He, was a, he stocked uh, groceries in a supermarket. These were not affluent people. He moved into Levittown. Uh, white returning war veterans were able to buy these homes uh, for uh, $90,000, $100,000 in today's money. African Americans who were prohibited, prohibited, not that they didn't want to, not because they didn't like living among whites. They were prohibited from moving into these suburbs, and they could easily afford to do so. Any working class family can afford to buy a home for $90,000, roughly twice national median income. African Americans who continue to pay rent um, in, in cities, in, either in public housing or in private um, uh, 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 housing in the cities. Uh, the white families who bought those homes for $90,000 over the next couple of generations, as you know, those houses those homes and developments like that now sell for three hundred, four hundred, five hundred thousand dollars and more. The white families over the next couple of generations uh, gained, you can do the arithmetic, uh, two hundred, three hundred, four hundred, half 400, half a million dollars in equity. They used that equity to send their children to college, to take care of medical emergencies, to take care of economic downturns, um, most importantly, to bequeath it to their children who then had down payments for their own homes. African Americans who accumulated none of that wealth as a result of this federal subsidy had none of those uh, abilities. Today, nationwide, African American incomes are on average about 60% of white incomes. That's a, a gap, it's a significant gap, and, and in my book I describe some of the federal policies that equally explicitly created that gap, but 60%. African-American wealth today is 10% of white wealth. That enormous disparity, you would think that if you had a 60% income ratio, you'd have a 60% wealth ratio. People with the same income levels can save the same amount of money. That enormous disparity between a 60% income ratio and a 10% wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy practiced in the mid-20th century that has never been remedied it's a constitutional violation. Of course, it determines the ongoing racial inequalities we have today. It obviously determines the, uh, the inability of African Americans to now move into homes in, in suburbs which are unaffordable to working class families. We passed the Fair Housing Act in 1968. It said, in effect, okay, African Americans, you, you're now, you can now move into Levittown or, or Lakewood or, or Panorama City or any of these other developments. But those homes are now selling for six, seven, eight times national median income. They're not affordable to working class families. They would have been uh, had they been permitted to, to do so. So this, this wealth gap that was created by these federal housing policies continued to determine the, uh, the racial uh, boundaries of our metropolitan areas. Levittown, for example, as a result of the Fair Housing Act now has an African American population of about 2% in a metropolitan area that's 16% African American. But it also, um, as, as you heard when I was introduced, that uh, the, the, um, uh, the racial segregation that we created with these unconstitutional policies determines the achievement gap in schools. It determines the violence that we experience uh, in, in concentrated areas of, uh, of hopelessness and, and, and poverty. It determines the lack of uh, upward mobility uh, that African Americans experience because what, what economists have, have demonstrated is that a low-income child, that's a child growing up in a low-income family who lives in a segregated neighborhood is much less likely to achieve a middle-class income as an adult as a child from the same low-income family who lives in a less segregated neighborhood. So it determines the persistence of the inequality 
that we've experienced. All right, I'll conclude in this way. Uh, in the course of writing this book, um, I, I uh, caused myself to uh, look at all of the American history textbooks that are the most commonly used in high schools in this country. Education has always been an interest of mine, and I wanted to see how we're teaching this history. And I looked at all of them, uh, all of the most commonly used ones, and of course, as, as you can imagine, uh, it was obvious to me that they all lie about this history. Um, that's a scientific term. Um, <laughs> they, uh, um, the most commonly used American history textbook, the most commonly used American history textbook in this country is something called The Americans. It's uh, 1,200 pages. Uh, in that uh, 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 1,200 pages, there is one paragraph with a subhead discrimination in the North. Within that one paragraph, uh, there is one sentence on housing, and the sentence reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves forced into segregated neighborhoods. That's it. You know, these publishers, uh, they spend a lot of money uh, hiring copy editors to look out for passive voice sentences, um, but this is one that they missed. Uh, <laughs> African Americans sort of woke up one day, they looked out the window and they said, hey look, we're in a segregated neighborhood. Um, uh, I am so delighted that there are high school students here today because if we don't do a better job of uh, teaching our young people the history that I've just described, they are going to be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been. Because as I said at the beginning, we have a national myth that determines the policy alternatives that we're able to consider. Under our constitutional system, if racial segregation happened by accident, it can only be undone by accident. But if racial segregation happened as a result of explicit public policy, then explicit public policy not only can, but is obligated to remedy it. So understanding this history is a precondition of going forward. I want to uh, finally conclude by urging all of you to do something about the way we're teaching this to young people. Uh, every one of you has uh, children or grandchildren um, in, in schools. You know school board members, you know uh, pr principals, you know superintendents. Um, uh, you can uh, do something uh, about the way in which we're teaching this history. And of course, if you begin uh, to uh, address how we're misteaching this history to young people, that will start a conversation among adults in the community as well. Because unless we have a national conversation that abolishes the myth of de facto segregation, we are going to be unable to develop the national consensus that's necessary to remedy it. So thank you very much, and um, I look forward to answering your questions. I'm going to refrain from asking school board members in the room or superintendents to stand up. <laughs> Today we are enjoying a Friday Forum with Richard Rothstein, research associate at the Economic Policy Institute and author, more importantly, of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. We're about to begin the audience Q&A. We welcome questions from everyone, City Club members, guests, students, and those of you joining us via our radio broadcast, our webcast, our live simulcast at the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Humanity Center at Cuyahoga Community College. If you'd like to tweet a question, you can tweet it at the City Club, and our staff will work it into the program. Holding our microphones today are content coordinator Bliss Davis and customer experience manager Corey Isler. Or, no, I'm sorry, Teola Orsanya, actually, who doesn't do customer experience but does a lot of other things quite capably. May we have our first question, please? <coughs> Uh, good afternoon. Thank you, <clears throat> thank you for your uh, speech or talk today. As a history teacher and just starting African American history at Solon High School, uh, the class and I, we kind of went through a redlining experiment. My question to you is, in 2014, ta -Nehisi Coates wrote uh, the case for reparations, and his argument was, we need to have public policy to address some of the policy that you just talked about. Your thoughts on the proposal of you know, maybe a billion dollar training of some sort he kind of uh, addressed towards the end of his article. Thank you. Uh, thank you. I, uh, I don't talk much about reparations because I think we need something much broader than reparations. What we need are policies. Some of them would be inexpensive. Some of them would be very expensive. If, for example, uh, we understood the history uh, that, that I just described, and the, any, any policy to remedy this today is completely politically unrealistic. 
So I want to emphasize that the first thing that needs to be done is to develop a new consensus around this. But if we understood this history, for example, uh, the federal government should uh, adopt a policy where it uh, purchases the next uh, you know, 10, 15 percent of homes that come up for sale in lev places like Levittown for $500,000 or whatever the market rate is and sell it to qualified African Americans for $100,000. That would be a narrowly targeted constitutional remedy for a very specific constitutional violation. It's politically absurd in the current environment because we don't understand the history. So that's an expensive one. At the other extreme, we have completely inexpensive ones. In fact, some of them would save money uh, by undoing this uh, history. Uh, we now have a, a, a program that uh, gives an enormous subsidy to homeowners in all white suburbs, uh, the mortgage interest deduction. We could withhold that mortgage interest deduction for many suburbs that didn't take steps to desegregate, whether by repealing an exclusionary zoning ordinance that it might have that prevents the building of townhouses or um, uh, uh, um, uh, you know, apartment buildings or even single family homes on small lot sizes. Maybe put the mortgage interest deduction for homes in that suburb in escrow until it began to take steps. That would be a, a cost free policy that we could do that would help to undo this. And there are many, many things in between. So I, I agree we need uh, policies to redress this. And I think it's, a, uh, it's a, a, a detour to talk about reparations because uh, individual payments, unconditional on, on uh, desegregation, are not gonna solve this problem and the next generation will be back in the same position we, were, we are today having uh, given out the, the reparations money. Uh, good afternoon. I'm so glad City Club brought you back. Thank uh, you. My name is Merle Johnson. I'm a member of the Ohio uh, Board of Education. And um, in, in reading research, uh, more and more articles are talking about how charter schools are moving more and more students to racial segregation. Uh, now, in this national and, and state environment in which there is a move on to completely privatize public education, um, which is devastating to so many students who depend on good public schools. Um, what kind of education policy, if you could, would you present to try to either slow down or stop this racial segregation that is increasing because of charter schools? Well, I'm so glad you're here, and I hope you heard what I said about the way in which we teach this history in our schools. Um, uh, of course, uh, charter schools and privatization are increasing the segregation of our schools, but it's al always easy to, to uh, focus on things that change rather than things that remain the same. The overwhelming segregation of our schools uh, exists before charter schools and, and privatization. So if we have schools that are in, in, in segregated neighborhoods that are 90% uh, white or 90% black, and the charter schools and the privatized schools increase it to 95% or 95% um, uh, uh, or black or 95% white. That's not the major problem. Major problem is the 90% segregation that we had in the first place. And that exists because the neighborhoods in which schools are located are segregated. So it's true that charter schools exacerbate it, but the underlying problem, we would be making a big mistake if we focused on this marginal change rather than on the underlying problem. Housing policy is education policy. And if we want to integrate our schools, the way to do it is we have to integrate our communities. And there are many, many policies we could follow. I, I, in the an answer to the previous question, I, I didn't go into them in great detail, and uh, we don't have time now. I do have a chapter in the book uh, that talks about things we could do, and some of them are not as politically unrealistic as the extreme ones I just talked about. They're still politically unrealistic, but we're closer to some of them than we need to be. We could. Um, you know, we have policies that are aimed at low-income families, um, uh, the Section 8 voucher program that you're all familiar with, and, and uh, the low-income housing tax credit. Both of those programs serve to reinforce segregation. We could easily modify both of those programs so that they create incentives to help low-income families move into middle-class communities. And that would desegregate schools. And it's the best way to desegregate schools, in my view. <laughs> 
Um, hi. So, hi. Um, Carter G. Woodson wrote a book called The Miseducation of the Negro. And in this novel, he explains how African Americans are taught their inferiority by lack of inclusion in the origin of the curriculum. Um, what are your views on this? Well, I don't know. I, I, uh, you know, African Americans are included in the curriculum these days, but in trivial ways. It's not that uh, every student doesn't learn about Martin Luther King and Rosa Parks and, um, you know, a few others like that. But um, I, I'm just repeating myself. What we need is to talk about the history of, of how the, the, the characteristics of slavery were perpetuated by government policies that um, we have not fully acknowledged. And uh, I call it, you know, the subtitle of my book is called A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. It wasn't hidden. Everybody knew these policies 40, 50 years ago. Um, uh, we had a, um, a Republican Secretary of Housing and, um, and, uh, um, and Urban Development, uh, George Romney, the uh, father of the recent presidential candidate, who announced to the nation that the federal government has built, created a white noose around um, African American communities. It was the federal government's obligation to untie that noose. Because everybody, every well-educated person knew about these policies. Anybody who moved into these suburbs knew what the deeds that the FHA required to be put in their homes said. Uh, anybody who moved into public housing knew what the, the requirements of, of public housing were. So this is, this is not a, a hidden history. It's a, it's a forgotten history. And I think it's the history of how you know, the 13th Amendment that abolished slavery required Congress also to uh, enact policies to eliminate what uh, they call the badges and incidents of slavery. And we didn't do it. And so we created a caste system uh, of uh, second-class citizenship which include a, 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 a pro prohibition on a free ownership of property, which perpetuated the conditions of slavery. And those are the things we need to, to teach people. Um, of course, we need to uh, teach African-American history as well. But simply, uh, uh, and I don't mean to, to minimize your question, but simply putting more black faces in textbooks without teaching this history is not going to do what we need to do. Thank you so much for your research. Uh, two questions. Uh, you hadn't mentioned the passage of the Fair Housing Act. And for many of us, I know in this room, that was very important and helped us to integrate some of the neighborhoods that and, and communities that we live in in this area. So if you could comment on that. And also, I learned recently that most of the wealth <laughs> Uh, in the greater Cleveland area is from real estate. And I'm wondering, you know, clearly the real estate industry has played a huge role in redlining and other discriminatory practices. Well, those are several questions, but they're all interesting ones, so I'll try to remember them. The Fair Housing Act. The Fair Housing Act is an important act uh, it was passed in 1968, although it didn't have any enforcement mechanisms until 1988. So it's a fairly recent development. And it's resulted in some progress. As I said earlier, get using Levittown as an example, uh, the population of Levittown is now 2% African American as a result of the Fair Housing Act. But that gap between the 2% and the 16% has never been remedied because the Fair Housing Act only prohibited future discrimination. It did nothing to undo the results of uh, past discrimination. Um, uh, all right, now I forgot the second question. What was this? The oh, yes, very important. It's um, part of our national myth is that the real estate industry uh, acted as individuals to um, uh, steer families away from homes and redlining. Uh, you know, the map, I don't. Uh, Dan showed a copy of my book before, but the, the cover of the book is a, a map that the government drew of uh, um, every metropolitan area in the country in which it colored red neighborhoods where either African Americans lived or African Americans lived nearby to um, recommend that the FHA not and, and other government agencies not uh, insure loans in those communities. And that came to be known as redlining, and the real estate industry followed it. But it's important to understand that 
real estate practices were not a form of de facto segregation. Every real estate broker in this country is licensed by a state licensing board. The National Association of Real Estate Boards in 1924 adopted a code of ethics prohibiting real estate agents from integrating communities, saying that they, uh, it was a, a violation of the code of ethics of a real estate broker to sell a home in a white neighborhood to an African American family. That was public. So any time a state licensing agency licensed a member of the National Real Estate Board, it was engaging in a violation of its 14th Amendment responsibilities by embracing racial segregation. And in many cases, uh, state licensing boards uh, enforced, uh, incorporated that language into their own licensing policies. So the real estate agent, the industry cannot be thought of as, a, uh, as private actors operating without the color of law. And the same thing is true of, of other um, things that are typically thought of as, as being private activity. Banks. Banks are, are the most heavily regulated industry in the country aside from real estate. Every bank is, has, has uh, federal inspectors crawling all over it, examining their loan portfolios, making sure they, they're using sound practices. Every, um, every federal regulator knew about the bank redlining practices and approved those practices as part of the, whether it was the controller of the currency or the Federal Reserve Board or the old Office of Thrift Supervision. These were policies were all embraced by federal regulators. So to think of these as private activities is a mistake. It was part of the whole government system that we had to create racial patterns in this country. And I, I'll just say one more thing. Redlining that you mentioned, the practice of not uh, extending mortgage guarantees to African Americans and African American neighborhoods is well known. But I, I hope you will remember that the far more powerful policy of federal agencies was not refusing to guarantee mortgages in black neighborhoods, but it was the subsidization of all white suburbs, which had nothing to do with redlining and pro the prohibition of African Americans from moving into those suburbs. That was the far more powerful policy, and it's far less remembered today than the redlining. Thank you for your speech. I think it was really informative in highlighting sort of how de jure segregation is driving the institutionalized racism within our country. But at the same time, as a high schooler, I find it relatively difficult to dismiss this notion of de facto segregation immediately because, you know, as someone from a relatively affluent community, I see every day when I go to lunch that we have, you know, a table with African Americans, a table with Asians, a table with Caucasians, and that's almost not driven by, you know, economic policy or any sort of school rules, but rather by who we decide to associate with. So in terms of addressing this issue within our society, do you believe that there is a component which is de facto, or do you think that it's sort of a cyclic process by which addressing it on a federal level would in turn change our perceptions and then change the de facto segregation as well? That's, uh, that's really an excellent question. And um, if I said something that indicates that I think that federal, state, and local policy was the sole cause of uh, segregation in this country, and there's not private prejudice that exists, and people uh, uh, not uh, being used to associating with other race neighbors, I, I, I misspoke. Clearly, both are involved, but uh, the point I'm making is that but for federal, state, and local policy, those individual prejudices would not have had the power to create the segregated patterns that we have in this country. As I, I said earlier, you know, you. There was this enormous housing shortage in the country. Uh, Levittown or any of these other suburbs prohibited African Americans from moving in. Maybe if, they'd, if, the, Federal, if the Federal Housing Administration had granted a, a, a bank guarantee to Levitt on condition that he, he sell homes on a non-discriminatory basis, maybe some whites wouldn't have wanted to live there. That's all right. There were 10 people applying for that development for everyone who got in. Uh, and if we had created integrated patterns as a result of federal policy, some people wouldn't have liked it, but we would have gotten used to it, and we would have had a much more integrated society today than we, we do in fact have. So federal policy, state policy creates these pr personal attitudes, and the personal attitudes then create public policy. It's a circular process, but the way we can intervene is with public policy. I don't believe that we should uh, say, well, we can't uh, change public policy um, until we change everybody's heart. That's not the way uh, a democracy works.
Richard Rothstein, ladies and gentlemen, research associate at the Economic Policy Institute and author of The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Today's forum is part of our Education Innovation Series, sponsored by the Nordson Corporation. We have Nordson representatives with us today. We are so grateful for your support. It's also part of our Authors in Conversation series, supported in part by the residents of Cuyahoga County through a public grant from Cuyahoga Arts and Culture. We're grateful to many of you here today for your support of City Club programming through that public grant. Our forum today is also the Colleen Shaughnessy Memorial Forum, endowed by Sherrod Brown, Richard Shatton, Michael Crystal, Jerry Sheehan, and Joseph Tegreen. We're delighted that Michael and Joe are with us today. Thank you very much for your support. Thank you for joining us. Community partners for our event today are Cleveland Neighborhood Progress and the Legal Aid Society of Greater Cleveland. Our hospitality partner is the Metropolitan at the Nine Hotel. We also welcome guests at tables hosted by Friends of Dick Obermans Western Reserve and Western Reserve Land Conservancy. That brings us to the end of our program. Thank you, Mr. Rothstein. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Our forum is adjourned. For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org. Production and distribution of City Club forums on IdeaStream are made possible by the generous support of PNC and the Raskin Family Fund, with additional funding from Robert Conrad, Cleveland State University, the Chautauqua Institution, the Cleveland Clinic, and the United Black Fund of Greater Cleveland Incorporated.